physics scholars. We are on chapter five, beginning a new chapter. Work, definition of work. Chapter five starts on page 154. Work in physics is different than when your parents made you go outside and work by mowing the lawn or pulling weeds in the flower bed or you have to go down and work at the cafeteria. Physics definition of work. Work is done on an object when two things are going on. A force causes a displacement of the object. So I am not doing work if I walk over to the wall and push on the wall as hard as I can push on the wall. Even though I'm supplying a force, <clears throat> there's no displacement to that wall. I have done no work on that wall. So I have to have force, and it causes a displacement of an object. Now, in order for us to figure out how much work is done, we have to figure out the component of force that is in the same direction, or we call it parallel, to the displacement. So let's look at this crate right down here. We have this big crate, <clears throat> and somebody is really, really short, and they've hooked up a rope, and they are pulling on this crate. Oh, I forgot to put them. Long arms, long arms reaching over. They're pulling on this crate. They can only pull down and forward a little bit. And they're able to move this crate because they're really, really strong, like Humphrey. And so what work has been done? Well, I need to figure out the component of this force. Right now, this force is moving at this angle. I need to find the component of the force that is actually moving this crate forward. This crate is moving forward in this direction. You can see we have some displacement that's going on in that direction. So I need to find that component. Well, if I know the red, or it was originally blue, the force I'm pulling, and if I take the cosine of the angle, I will get the component that is parallel, that is moving in this direction which is parallel to my displacement. So work, physics definition of work, is force times displacement. As long as I have that force in the direction of displacement. And if it's pulling at some angle, then I just need to resolve that into its component. So if I say force times the cosine of the angle times the displacement, They've done FD cosine angle, rearranged the formula just a little bit, but that's what it's from. Force times the cosine of the angle gives me the component in the direction of that displacement. Now, if I am pulling exactly in the same direction it's moving, so let's say here is my object, but say I'm pulling in this direction, and the displacement, so my force is in that direction, and my displacement also happens to be in that same direction, it's moving in that direction, well, this formula still works. You can think of, what's the angle there? Well, the angle there is zero degrees now. There's not any angle that's opened up. If you happen to take the cosine of zero degrees, you get one. And if you multiply by one, it does not change a value. So we can drop the cosine of theta if the angle is zero. If you want to keep it there, take cosine of zero and get one, and then multiply it by one, be my guest. You may do it that way. Sign conventions of work. We can have positive work and we can have negative work. So let's first start out by listening to one of their videos. Hopefully I'll have the volume turned up loud enough that you can hear. Energy can be defined as the ability to do work. So to understand energy, you need to understand work. Work is the product of the force on an object, the displacement of the object, and the cosine of the angle between them. Since the cosine can be positive or negative, the resulting value for work can be positive or negative. For instance, if you pull a toy car across a level surface as pictured, the work is positive. The effect of your work should be to speed the car up. Notice that the force, if broken up into components, has a rightwards component. This rightward component agrees with the displacement of the car. However, if you pull, as pictured here, you will tend to slow the car down. Since the force is to the left, while the motion is to the right, the work done is negative. Again, the force and motion are in opposite directions here. 
so the work will once again be negative. The work will have the effect of slowing down the car. Here, the force and displacement are in the same direction again. Work is positive and the car speeds up. You can remember this two different ways. First, you can simply picture the force as being in the same direction as or in the opposite direction to the motion. Opposites are negative, so the work is negative when the force opposes the motion. Alternatively, you can visualize the angle between the displacement and the applied force. When the cosine of this angle is positive, the work done on the object is positive. When the cosine is negative, the work done on the object is negative. One last thing to remember is that when the force and the displacement are at right angles, no work is done. So catch that less last one right over here. There's only work done if there is a component of the force parallel to the direction of motion. So the last one here, that car is moving to the right. Somebody's trying to lift it up by a string. Even though they're applying a force to that string, there's no work done because that car is not moving upwards or there's no component of the force that's pulling upward in the direction to the right. So if we're pulling at 90 degrees or the force is at 90 degrees to the direction of motion, no work is done even though there is a force that is being applied there. So I mentioned two ways of figuring out whether you have positive or negative work. Conceptually, the concept of it, pretty easy. Let's look at the positive work side right over here. Positive work means I have a component of my force that is in the same direction as the pull. I'm helping along. That's positive work. Down here, I have a component of my force that's in the same direction as it's moving. I'm helping it along. Positive work. Negative work, we're working against the motion. So if my motion is to the right and I have my component of my force is going to be opposite of that motion back over here, that's negative work. I'm working against the displacement. Same thing here, displacement is to the right, my force is to the left, my component of force that would be parallel would be to the left, there would be the component of this right angle that would be parallel to my displacement. It's working against it, so that's negative work. So negative work works against the displacement, positive work works with the displacement. They also said you can work with the angle. If I take this one right over here and think of the angle, I have a displacement that's going like this, I have a force, here's my displacement, I have a force that's going like this. Well, this angle right here, that angle is between 0 and 90 degrees. If you take cosine of any angle between 0 and 90 degrees, you are going to get a positive answer. Cosine of any angle between 0 and 90 is positive. If I come back over here to this negative one, my displacement is to the right, my force, here's my displacement, my force is back here to the left. If I measure the angle in here between the displacement and my applied force, that angle's an obtuse angle. It's between 90 and 180 degrees. If you take the cosine of any angle between 90 and 180, an obtuse angle, you get a negative answer. So mathematically, it will also give you the correct sign, positive work or negative work. So you can do them both ways. You should understand them both conceptually. The concept, when I'm working with it, the displacement is positive, against it it's negative, as well as with the angle. So let's try one out. In your book, turn to page 156, number four. Let's see if we can do that problem. It says, if 2.0 joules of work, we need to talk about our units. Work, W, we're going to use that. 2.0 joules. J-O-U-L-E-S. Mr. Jewel. Not J-E-W-E-L. He didn't spell his name that way. He spelled it this way. Joules of work. Work is measured in a unit called joules. Now, that's a derived unit. We can figure out the derivation of it, if work equals force times displacement, I don't need that cosine of the angle in this, force is measured in newtons, displacement is measured in meters, then if I remember that a newton is a derived unit, it's a kilogram meter per second squared, 
times meters, I have joules, a kilogram meter squared per second squared. That is the derivation of what a joule is. So it breaks down into the basic SI unit of kilogram meter squared per second squared. We don't write kilogram meter squared per second squared, we write joule, much easier. So work is measured in joules. In that little video, <clears throat> they mentioned energy. About understanding energy, we need to first understand work. Think of an everyday life. In order to do work, you have to have some energy. Sunday morning when your dad woke you up and say, hey, I need you to go mow the lawn, well, you might have had kind of low energy. You didn't feel like doing much work. You need energy to do work. We're going to learn that energy is also measured in joules. Work and energy are actually kind of two different forms of the same thing. You can think of converting your energy into work. You're burning up energy doing work. You have less energy when you've done your work. It really translates well to physics definitions of energy and work as well. All right, so work, 2.0 joules. Back to number four here at page 156. 2.0 joules of work is done in raising a 100 gram apple. That sounds like a mass. Mass is 100, 180 gram apple. 180-gram apple. Now, right away, you should be thinking, wait a minute, grams is not the base unit of mass, kilograms is, so that really means 0 .10, 0 0.18 kilograms. Now, there are only two significant figures here. That 180, that zero is meaningless on the grams. Well, I shouldn't say meaningless, it's not significant in our count of significant figures. It holds a place. 180 grams is 0.18 kilograms, because that zero is not a significant figure. So just two significant figures. How far is this apple lifted? Distance is what they're wanting to know here. Okay, well, the formula we seem to have that may apply here is we know work equals force times distance. Now, I'm not going to throw in cosine of theta for this reason. Here is my apple. We are supplying a force up. We're lifting that apple. The displacement of that apple is also up. They want to know how far does it go up. So the angle between my force applied and the displacement is zero. Cosine of zero is one. I don't need to include it. So we just need to figure out how much force am I going to apply? Because we know how much distance, we just don't know how much force. Well, what? Force, I'll call this F sub A, applied force. What force are we working against? If you think of free body diagram, we're working against gravity, aren't we? Force due to gravity. And how do I get the force due to gravity? I'm sure I heard everybody say mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Well, I know the mass of my apple is 0.18 kilograms. And I know the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. So I know how much force I am going to have to overcome. When I overcome gravity, or I will as soon as we run it through. So run it through your calculators. Please say it loud enough so that I can hear it back on the day that I was recording this. Two significant figures. We have 1.8. 1.8 newtons of work. Now you may actually even want to leave that in your calculator there. We'll see what happens. I'm going to leave it all in my calculator. 1.7658. That's not an answer yet. That's just progressing along the way. So that's how much force we are going to have to apply. And we're going to apply that amount of force through a distance of... Oh, that's what we don't know. But we can rearrange this over here. We know our distance is going to be work divided by our force. And they told us we had 2.0 joules of work, and our force was that 1.8 or that 1.7658. I'm going to go 2 divided by my answer. Two significant figures 1.1 meters is how far we must have lifted that. We did 2 joules of work. All right. <clears throat>
energy, <coughs> excuse me, energy. <coughs> so if we have to have energy to do work, we now have some idea that work is just a different form of this stuff called energy. When I do work, I use up this stuff called energy. So what is energy? Well, energy is not something you can see or feel or pick up. It's, in physics, just a concept of, you might call it, the ability to do work. Energy is the ability to apply a force over a distance, if you have some energy. So we will be looking at some basic forms of energy, starting with kinetic energy. Now, we have run across this word kinetic before. When we were talking about friction, we had a coefficient of kinetic friction. And you remember what kinetic means? It means motion. So we're studying something with motion. This first part of physics is kinematics. Same root word. It's the physics of motion, things that are moving, forces applying to them. So kinetic energy is energy of motion. Energy of an object that is due to the object's motion. Call it kinetic energy. Kinetic energy depends on two things. If we have something moving, that something has a velocity to it. And if it is a something, it has some mass to it. At least right now it has a mass to it. Later on we're going to get to some, some things that actually exist but don't have any mass. That'll be fun. All right, here's our formula. Kinetic energy, hopefully you can read that, one-half mass times, now it says V squared. And usually we talk about velocity, one-half mass times velocity squared. I'll probably say that quite a bit. Technically, it's really speed. Now think a minute, what is the difference between velocity and speed? Velocity has a direction, speed does not. So if I'm going at two meters per second west, that's a velocity. If I'm just moving two meters per second, but we don't care the direction, that's just the speed I'm going. Kinetic energy is not a vector quantity. It does not have direction. So that's why speed is technically the thing there. We don't care about the direction. Energy just is an amount. It's a scalar quantity. So they are energy, all the types of energy are not vector quantities. They're simply scalar quantities. They are amounts. So kinetic energy, one-half mass times speed squared, one-half mv squared is the formula for it. We'll look at a little video here, then maybe talk a little bit more about kinetic energy before we hit our page 160 in that example. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. Both of these cars are moving, so they both have kinetic energy. Kinetic energy depends on both the velocity of an object and its mass. Kinetic energy is calculated by multiplying mass by velocity squared and dividing by two. If the red and green car each have the same mass, the red car has more kinetic energy because it is moving faster. So if you think about that for a minute, if I have a little car, we've got our VW Bug, it's moving at 25 meters per second. And then we have this big Mack truck that happens to be a jump truck full of rocks in the back. It's also moving at 25 meters per second. One of those has a lot greater ability to do work. Think about work again. Applying a force over a distance. If you stepped in front of that VW bug, now it would apply a force to you over a distance. But not near as great of a force, and probably not near as great of a distance as if you stepped in front of that Mack truck. That Mack truck has much more kinetic energy. I can increase the mass, move at the same speed, and I'm going to increase the kinetic energy. Even though the truck and the red car both have the same velocity, the truck has more kinetic energy because it has more mass. Well, what do you know? They just said the same thing. Now, there's another way I can increase the kinetic energy. I can keep the same mass. If I have, you can imagine me with these two tennis balls right here, and you're going to get ready to duck, so I'm going to throw them. If I have this one tennis ball, and I throw it at two meters per second, there's going to be less energy in that tennis ball than if I took one and reared back and threw the other one at 35 meters per second. Same mass but the higher velocity one is going to have more energy. It's going to hit you with a greater force. It's going to have a greater ability to do work. Page 160, number four. Let's see if we can try another problem here. Now that we have a new formula, our second formula. 
160 number four. It says two 3.0 gram bullets. So I have mass of these bullets, and they are both 3.0 grams, which immediately I think, hey, maybe grams is the wrong unit. How many kilograms? 1,000 grams in a kilogram. So we divide by 1,000, move that decimal place three places. One, two, three, point zero zero three kilograms. Three times 10 to the negative third. You could call it that. That would look very impressive. 3.0 times 10 to the negative third kilograms. So there's the mass of each of our bullets. They are fired with speeds of 40 meters per second and 80 meters per second, respectively. So the velocity of bullet one, 40.0 meters per second. Velocity of bullet two, 80.0 meters per second. Now, real quick before we do any math, does one have twice the kinetic energy of the other? No is the answer to that. If you haven't figured out why, we'll figure out why. Keep reading here in the problem. It says, what are their kinetic energies? Which bullet has more kinetic energy? And what is the ratio? And I just ask you, does one have twice the other? Ratio of two to one? The answer to that is no. We'll figure it out if you don't already have it figured out why one is not twice the kinetic energy of the other. So let's do kinetic energy of bullet one. I guess before I should do kinetic energy of bullet one, we should write down the formula that tells us how much kinetic energy is one half mass times our speed squared. So kinetic energy of bullet one, one half the mass, 0 0.003, we need it in our base unit of kilograms. It is moving at 40, which we must square. So run that through your calculator, verify my work. I got 2.4. So kinetic energy is measured in what? Joules. Energy is measured in joules, just like work is me measured in joules. 2.4 joules. Kinetic energy of bullet two, one half, same mass. It's moving at 80. Do your calculator. Nine point six joules. So the first questions up there, they said, what are the kinetic energies? So respect, respectively, two point four joules and two point and nine point six joules. Which bullet has more kinetic energy? The one that is moving at a faster speed. The one moving at that eighty meters per second. Now they say, what is the ratio of their two energies? Well, if I want to know the ratio, I'm going to take the big number and divide it by the small number. So if I take 9.6 and we divide it by our 2.4, we get the ratio of 4. It has 4 times more energy. Why didn't it just have twice the energy? It's moving at twice the speed. The reason it didn't have just twice the energy is because in this nice little formula, we have to square the speed. If you think of twice the speed, if you square two, two squared is four, four times as much energy. Conceptually, we actually could get how much energy it would have more. The ratio would be four times as much. Okay. Let's see, do I have another one of those or are we moving on? Moving on. Work kinetic energy theorem. Sounds like geometry, doesn't it? We have a theory, a theorem. Work kinetic energy theorem. The network done by all the forces acting on an object is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. Remember we talked about energy can be changed into work? How much work is done equals how much energy we have lost, change in the amount of energy we've lost. That's what this is saying, the work kinetic energy theorem. Let me rewrite it up here. They have set it on the board, the network, network, so I can write it this way, network, I can say the sum of all the work, the network 
equals any change in kinetic energy of an object. So if I have this baseball and it is flying through the air at 35 meters per second, hits me on the side of the face, ouch, it's going to do some work on my face. It's going to apply a force and it's probably going to move my face some distance. How much work it does on my face will equal the energy it loses. That will slow down the baseball. It's no longer moving at 35 meters per second. It's now slowed down. Maybe it's only moving at 2 meters per second. Or maybe I slowed it all the way down to zero. However much kinetic energy that baseball lost equals the amount of work it did to my face. Now, change in kinetic energy, physics, when we have a change in something, it's always final minus initial. So my change in kinetic energy is the final kinetic energy I have minus the initial kinetic energy that I have. There is my change in kinetic energy. And the work, kinetic energy theorem, says that's going to have to equal to however much work that object did. If it slowed down, it must have done work on something else. That's why it slowed down. Page 162, number 2. A 2.0 times 10 to the third kilogram car. Sounds like a mass. Put these in your notes. They give you examples of how we do problems. 2.0 times 10 to the third kilogram. Accelerates from rest. That's an initial velocity of zero accelerates from rest under the action of two forces. One is a forward force of 1140 newtons provided by an attraction between the wheels and the road. So let's call that force applied, 1140 newtons. And this is moving forward, same direction the car is going. The other is a 950 newton resistive force due to the various frictional forces. 950 newtons. So I'm going to call that F sub F for friction. Now it's working against this other force. I'm going to call it a negative 950 newtons because it's working backward. Remember, a force is a vector quantity. It has direction to it. 950, not 95, put my zero in, 950 newtons. Keep reading here. What else do we have going on? Use the work kinetic energy theorem to determine how far the car must travel for its speed to reach 2.0 meters per second. So we have a final velocity of 2.0 meters per second. And they want to know what distance. I can call it delta x for the distance. That's what we're trying to figure out. How far is this car going to have to go? Well, according to our work kinetic energy theorem, network is going to equal any change in kinetic energy. And we can figure out the change in kinetic energy because we know that's going to be the kinetic energy final minus the kinetic energy initial. And we know the final kinetic energy because Kinetic energy is found by taking one half mv squared. We know the mass of the car, and we know how fast that car is going to end up traveling. So let's get our final kinetic energy. One half mass, what is it, 2 times 10 to the third, <clears throat> also called 2,000, times it's traveling at 2 meters per second, and that 2 has to be squared. Now, minus our initial kinetic energy. Well, initially, how fast were we moving? Zero. So how much kinetic energy do we have when we have no motion? Zero. So really, this thing falls out. 
So our whole change in kinetic energy is this positive value, whatever it is. I want to come back to the left side where I get work. I know work equals force applied times distance. So since they're wanting to know the distance we have traveled, I could find the distance I have traveled by just dividing all this stuff by the force that's applied over that distance. And they told me about the forces up here. I work again, it's net force times distance. So if I have 1140 newtons forward, negative 950, the opposite direction, so what's the net of that? If I take 1140 and subtract 950, we have 190. We have 190 newtons of work down here. So I should be able to figure out my distance traveled. 1 half times 2,000 is 1,000. 1,000 times 2 squared 4, that's 4,000. Whatever 4,000 divided by 190 is, it must have traveled 21 meters. We use the work kinetic energy theorem. That's how we got our distance, because we knew our work was force times distance. So we could figure out how far that car had traveled. Try another one that uses this work kinetic energy theorem. On a frozen pond, maybe we'll get some frozen ponds around here this year. Maybe we'll have a real winter. I remember when I was a kid growing up around here, we would have some real winters where the ponds would freeze thick enough. My sister and I, my closest sister to my age, um, we would go out and we would ice skate. We didn't have ice skates. We'd just do our shoes, but we'd sweep off and clear off this junk that was on the pond, and the ice was thick enough. We would skate on the ponds. On a frozen pond. A person kicks a 10 kilogram sled, giving it an initial speed of 2.2 meters per second. How far does the sled move? If the coefficient, oh, this is getting exciting. They're combining last chapter. If the coefficient of kinetic friction between the sled and the ice is 0 0.10. So real life here, we don't have this frictionless surface going on. We actually have some friction between the sled and that ice that is going on. All right, so let's see. We know that net work, I'm going to say the total, sum of the work, must equal any change in kinetic energy. So let's see if we can start breaking this thing down a minute. We know that work is going to be the net force we apply times the distance we apply it. And we know change in kinetic energy will be our final kinetic energy minus our initial kinetic energy. So on a frozen pond, we kick a 10 kilogram sled. So let's get some of that information. The mass of our sled, 10.0 kilograms, three significant figures. An initial speed of 2.2 meters per second. So I have an initial velocity of 2.2 meters per second. How far does it move? Coefficient of kinetic friction. Mu sub k, 0 0.10, coefficient of kinetic friction. How far does it move? Well, tell me the final velocity of this sled. Zero. How far does it move until it stops, is the insinuated conclusion. It's going to slide. Friction's going to slow it down. And at some point, it's going to stop. Well, how far does it move in that amount of time. So if I come back over here, we know our final kinetic energy is zero. It stopped. Zero minus our initial kinetic energy. Well, kinetic energy is one half the mass. What's our mass? 10. And initially, it's moving at 2.2 squared. So I'm just working here on the right side for a minute. So we do that, let's see, negative a half of 10 is negative 5. Negative 5 times 2.2 squared. 
negative 24.2. I have negative 24.2, <clears throat> and that happens to be joules of kinetic energy. The question was, how far does it go? I didn't show up when I circled it for you, did it? How far does it go? Well, back up here, I could solve for the distance it goes if I just divide this by the net force that's acting on this sled. So let's hold off on this and see if we can figure out how to get the net force acting on this sled. Let's draw a free body diagram. Here's the sled. So what are all the forces acting on the sled? Well, I know I have a force due to gravity that's pulling down. I know that I have a normal force pulling up. And how do those two forces compare? Equal. That sled's not levitating, it's not sinking into the ice, so those are equal, so those things net force is zero in that direction. I kick the sled, I have some force due to my, oh, which way do we kick the sled? Oh, look up here. We're kicking the sled backwards. So I have some force that I apply, I'm gonna call that F sub A. Now I don't need to worry about these two because they, they're in equilibrium, they just cancel each other out. I applied some force, and there's also some friction working against it. Force of kinetic friction that's working against it over here. Well, maybe I shouldn't have crossed off those F sub G's and F sub N's quite so quickly. I don't know the force I've applied yet, do I? But I do know... I do know, oh, actually, we're wanting to know how far that thing goes. I don't need this force supply because the only thing working on it now is friction that's slowing it down in this problem. I need to figure out the force of friction that's slowing it down. They told us something about friction. They gave us a coefficient of friction. And we, of course, remember, hey, I know about the coefficient of kinetic friction. It equals the kinetic frictional force divided by the normal force. So if I want to solve for my kinetic frictional force, I can just take the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And I'll be able to get this net force acting on this sled back here, which is just friction working against it as it slides along. So how can I get the normal force? Well, it must equal the force due to gravity, because those things are in equilibrium. And we know the force due to gravity is mass times acceleration due to gravity. And we know the mass of this sled, what was it, 10? And the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81. So I know that I have 98.1, and we have three significant figures. I have 98.1 newtons of force from gravity, which must also be the normal force, 98.1 newtons. So back over here, getting this frictional force, I just need my coefficient of friction, 0.1, times my normal force, 98.1. And that kind of just undoes, undoes what we did a minute ago. When I multiply by 0.1, I've got a force of 9.81. Now, this force is moving opposite the direction. This thing is going a direction to the right, a distance to the right. So that net force, when I come up here to put it in, is actually a negative 9.81 because it's working against where I am going. So let's try a negative 24.2 divided by a negative 9.81, I guess two negatives, we're gonna get a positive answer, you could have forgotten that. Two point, how many significant figures? Oh, 2.2 .2 only has two significant figures. 2.5 meters. 
That is how far that slit is going to slide across the ice before it comes to a stop. All figured out by this work kinetic energy theorem right up here. We know that the network done and work is force times distance. So we can solve forces or solve distances. When we know kinetic energy, one half mass, velocity squared, or speed squared, one half mv squared. All right, that problem is also a sample problem done on page 161 for you. You can see how the book did it as well. Okay, potential energy. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. We studied that. Formula, one half mv squared. Potential energy is associated with an object. It's the energy that because of its position, maybe its shape, the condition it is in, it can do some work. It has the potential to do some work. And there are two types of potential energy that we will study. The first is gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy is due to the stored energy from the gravitational field. Now, you're not able to see my demonstration, so I'll try to describe my demonstration. I'm holding up a tennis ball above the table. Now, that tennis ball has the potential to do some work. Right now, it's not moving at all. It's just sitting there in my hand. But because of the gravitational field it's sitting in, if I let go of that tennis ball, it would start moving. And it would start moving faster and faster and faster and be gaining kinetic energy. When it hits the table, it could do some work on the table. Probably it's not going to move the table very far. But gravitational potential energy. Now, I was holding that tennis ball above the table. <clears throat> if I step to the side so that now I'm holding it at the same height, but I'm above the ground, it is farther to drop. It is greater potential energy because it would be moving faster when it hit the ground down there. I could figure out how much kinetic energy, one half mv squared. It's moving faster here. It has a greater potential energy because it has a greater potential height to drop through. Gravitational potential energy, potential energy stored in the gravitational fields of interacting bodies. Gravitational potential energy depends on the height from a zero level. Right here, potential energy, potential energy, and this is gravitational potential energy, we'll put a little sub G, equals the mass times the acceleration due to gravity times how high I am holding it above ground zero. Now when I'm holding this tennis ball above the table, ground zero is the table, that's as far as it can drop. If I step over so that I'm holding it above same height, but above the ground, it can drop farther. So my ground zero is the floor now, where before the ground zero is the table. So that H is the height above wherever I'm calling ground zero, how far it can drop. So MGH, we'll see ourselves a little video. Potential energy is sometimes known as energy of position or stored energy. One form of potential energy is gravitational potential energy. An object that is raised above ground level has work done on it. This work increases its energy. At the top of the slope, the ball is not moving, but it has the potential to do so. If it falls, the gravitational potential energy will change to kinetic energy. There are many other forms of potential energy. A piece of wood, for example, contains chemical potential energy that can be converted into heat and light when it burns. Increasing pressure along a fault line does work on the various rock layers and increases the potential energy along the line. This energy is released during an earthquake. So potential energy is stored energy in some form. The gravitational field is storing that energy if we're talking about gravitational potential energy. Uh, chemical in wood, burning those chemicals, burning the wood releases the energy in the chemicals. They talk about an earthquake. So potential energy is stored energy of some form. Gravitational potential energy is the first, and we're only going to learn two types here in physics, is the first type we have, found by mass times acceleration due to gravity times height. Second type of potential energy that we are going to learn about is elastic potential energy. Energy available for use when a deformed elastic object returns to its original configuration. 
So elastic potential energy, you can think of a bow, like a bow and arrow. If I pull that bow back, I have stored some elastic potential energy. If I let it go, it's going to spring back to its original position. Now notice I had to do some work. I had to apply a force over a distance to store that energy into the system. I'm kind of converting back and forth between work and energy, both measured in joules. So here's our formula. You can see it in the book. Elastic potential energy. Potential energy, we'll do a sub E for elastic. One half kx squared. K is the um, spring constant, elastic constant. We'll talk a little bit more about that. X is the displacement, how much it's stretched or compressed from its original position. So 1 half kx squared, the spring constant is how stiff the spring is. Or if you're thinking of a bow and a bow and arrow, how stiff or hard it is to pull that bow back. The stiffer it is, the higher the spring constant. And the more energy it stores for every centimeter you pull it back. So the symbol k is called the spring constant, a parameter, a value that measures the spring's resistance to being compressed or stretched. Maybe when you were a kid, you took apart those click ballpoint pins, and you had that little spring in there. Um, when I was in elementary school, we could, we'd make little shooters out of those little um, ballpoint pins. I've forgotten how we did them, but they had a little trigger, and, and you would store the energy in that spring, and then pow, and it'd shoot something. We never did it in class, of course. If you think of those little springs in the pin, they're not very strong. It's really easy to squeeze those with your fingers. But if you think of a big car spring, I don't know if you've ever seen these big coils underneath the car by the, by the tires inside the wheel. Um, those are big stiff things, and there's no way with your hands you could compress those at all. Very high spring constant, very hard to compress. So if we look at the diagram here, if this is our normal position for this block that's hooked to this spring, here is the relaxed length of the spring out there. Then it has been compressed to this position. Well, the compressed length of the spring back over here, our distance compressed is the x in that formula. How far has it been compressed or stretched if I pull it out? So it's not how long the spring is, it's the distance it's compressed or the difference from where it normally is to where you've moved it, that compressed distance. Here's a video about the spring constant to kind of elaborate on that just a little bit more. The spring constant determines how much force a spring will exert for a given compression or expansion. For example, if we attach one kilogram weights to each of these springs, we see that they stretch different amounts. The larger the spring constant, the stiffer the spring and the more force that is required to stretch it. The spring constant depends on the type and amount of material the spring is made of and how the spring is formed. Notice the units for the spring constant. It's measured in newtons per meter. How much force it takes to change that spring's position one meter. So if it only takes 66 newtons to move it a meter, that's a smaller spring constant than if it takes 110 newtons to move up one meter. So our spring constant is measured in the units of newtons per meter. Let's try a problem. When a 2.00 kilogram mass is attached to a vertical spring, the spring is stretched 10.0 centimeters, such that the mass is 50 centimeters above the table. What is the gravitational potential energy associated with the mass relative to the table? So there are two types of potential energies going on here. I have the spring that's attached to the ceiling somewhere, I guess. And it is stretched 10 centimeters, such as the mass is 50 centimeters above the table. There's a table down here. Let's say I put some mass on it here. I stretched it. And maybe it originally started right there, so it only stretched 10.0 centimeters. Now it is still 50.0 centimeters above the tabletop. 
And their first question is, what is the gravitational, try a different color, what is the gravitational potential energy associated with the mass relative to the table? Well, potential energy due to gravity, we know that is mass times acceleration due to gravity times the height that it may fall. And I know the mass of this thing, what is the mass of this thing? Two kilograms. And I know the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81. Now, energy is scalar, not kinetic. So I don't care whether it's a negative 9.81 or a positive 9.81. It's a scalar quantity, no direction. And the height, well, the height this thing may call, fall, 50 centimeters, but I need that in the right unit, 0.5 meters. So I know that 50 centimeters equals 0 0.500 meters. 100 centimeters in a meter, but that decimal twice, 0 0.5 meters. So we multiply all this together, get my calculator out. Oh, that's easy. 2 times 0 0.5 is 1, 1 times 9.81 is 9.81. We have three significant figures. We do. Energy, 9.81 what? Joules. We have 9.81 joules of gravitational potential energy. Second part, what is the spring's elastic potential energy? Elastic potential energy. <clears throat> if the spring constant happens to be 400 newtons per meter, pretty stiff spring down there. Okay. Well, we know potential energy, elastic, is one half k x squared. Now notice that kind of looks like the kinetic energy. One half m p squared. Well, this is one half k x squared. Might help you remember it. One half spring constant. They said it was 400 newtons per meter. X displaced. It stretched 10 centimeters. That's our displacement, or 0 0.100 meters. 0 0.1 meters. 0 0.1 meters, that has to be squared. And this should tell us our elastic potential energy. Let's see, half of 400 is 200. 200 times 0.1, which has to be squared. 2 joules. 2 point, how many significant figures in our original? 3 everywhere. 2 point. Zero, zero joules of elastic potential energy. So if you were asked the question, what is the total potential energy associated with that spring at that location? It's not that one is positive going down and the other is negative going up or vice versa. These are just scalar quantities. So our total energy, the total potential energy, they didn't ask, but if they ask, is adding them together. 9.81 plus the 2 gives us 11.81 total joules of energy associated with this system. Let's try another one. A 70 kilogram stunt man. Mass, 70.0 kilograms. Is attached to a bungee cord with an unstretched length of 15 meters. So here's my bungee cord, unstretched length, relaxed length is 15 meters. He jumps off the bridge, spanning a river. Now, why did he do that? I'm not sure, but anyway, that happens to be at a height of 50 meters. So there's the whole height, bridge to river is 50 meters. When he finally stops, the cord has a stretched length of 44 meters. So he finally stops, he's dangling down here, didn't smash into the rocks on the riverbed, so that's good. He's dangling down there, and that's 44 meters. It says, treat the stuntman as a point mass. Well, that's all we can do. And disregard the weight of the bungee cord. That's good. Assuming the spring constant of the bungee cord, hey, that sounds like a K value, is 71.8 newtons per meter. What is the total potential energy? What is the total potential energy relative to the water when the man stops falling? So if I want to know my total potential energy, see if I can get a better sigma. Total potential energy is all the potential energies added together. I've got elastic potential energy. That bungee cord has been stretched. Plus, I have some gravitational potential energy. 
That stunt man is hanging at a height still. He can still drop a ways. Well, potential energy elastic is one half kx squared. Gravitational potential energy is mgh. So let's just fill in some stuff. One half k, what's that? 71.8. X. X is the stretch. Now be careful. 44 is not the answer. What is the answer for K? For X? Right there is X. Relax length is 15. Stretch length is 44. So how much has it changed from its original? 29. That is a 29 meter stretch. So that is my x value, 29. That has to be squared. Don't forget that squared. Plus mass. Oh, we've got a mass of this bungee jumper, 70. Gravity, 9.81. Let's not call it negative. This is a scalar quantity, potential energy. Height, h. It's not 50. What is it? Right here is its potential to fall height, 6 meters. 44 is the end of his rope. 50 meters is the distance of the water. There's a difference there of 6 meters. So he still has 6 meters that he may potentially fall. Total energy, run it through your calculators. Let's see what we get. significant figures. I think we have three. If we look at all our original data, we have three. 3.43, and I'm writing this in scientific notation, 3.43 times 10, let's see, one, two, three, four, times 10 to the fourth joules. Of energy. And there's another interesting way it could have been written. If I call this 34.3, that would be times 10 to the third joules. 10 to the third is a kilo, right? 34.3 kilojoules of energy. Sometimes we do it that way. So you may run across it written that way. KJ, kilojoules of energy. I would do the 3.43 times 10 to the fourth. But once in a while, you might run across them talking about kilojoules. We know kilo is 10 to the third. All right, chapter five, sections one and two, you have your syllabus. So you can start reading and answering questions. <laughs>